All right. So, yes, Jessica, over to you. Oh, hello, uh, Mr. Ali Jana. It's wonderful to be here today. I'm Dr. Jessica Adam. Do you want me to yeah. go ahead and introduce yeah, myself? Yeah, yeah. No, it's all yours now. Now you show and you're going to listen. Oh, wow. This is exciting. I hope for lots of questions. I love yeah. active participation. So a little bit about myself. I founded Mindset News on Facebook and YouTube at the beginning of COVID because I felt that at this time, at, at no time in history before now have youth ever needed as much leadership as they need right now. So I founded Mindset News to inspire youth around the world to continue their education despite the chaos. And a little bit about my background, I've been in international education for over 20 years. In 1991, I lived in rural Korea, uh, north of Seoul, uh, but south of the DMZ. And that was prior to Korea's development. I was super impressed with the citizen focus on work ethic, skills training, and education in general. And that was where I developed a great fondness and appreciation and respect for people in developing nations. And I've lived in several countries. I've been at Miami University in Ohio for the past six years. And when I started there, I realized that 19 year olds, despite their status as adults, aren't actually that mature. I know it's not very shocking, uh, but so I developed all kinds of systems to help um, this age range become their best selves. Uh, every college student can use a lesson in time management, for example, but there are so many other soft skills, um, conflict mitigation, conflict resolution, uh, how to think win-win, how to be results oriented. And each individual out there on earth has something inside of them that's designed to solve a problem on this planet. And while education is awesome, and I'm certainly um, a super consumer of education, um, it's not a requirement to solve community problems. And the idea of critical thinking is just vital to, um, to development of our localities. Um, and I, I can give you one example of creative problem solving. Uh, Mr. Ali Jana, and it's a puzzle. And so a farmer has six sheep and these six sheep each have a, a pen or an area that they live in that is the same size. So all of the animal enclosures are the same size, six animals. One night a thief comes and he steals a piece of the fencing. And the next day, the farmer rebuilds six animal enclosures. Again, they're all the same size, but he has one less piece of fencing. So I'm gonna let the listeners see if they can solve that problem. I'm not gonna give the solution yet. Uh, I'm, I, I know that you're monitoring all kinds of chats. See if anybody responds uh, to, to that question. And uh, I kind of started rambling, but uh, so I developed all of these methods to help students become their best selves because, and I'm saying that each person has something inside of them designed to solve a problem out there because 
is sometimes people forget that. And if if the East is, too, I'm sorry, if the West, like the U.S., if we're too focused on the individual, I get that. But in the way I look at it is the individual is the unit of society. Each person has to find their own motivation. And Mr. Ali Jinnah, your motivation isn't necessarily the same as mine. And that's fine. You're a different person. You're a unique person. But we do all live within this big thing we call society. And so for me, the question is using that unit measure of the individual of society, how can our societies become better? And last year, my research was published on the purpose of really any curriculum in, in the world. And now we're talking about education, uh, but you know, one of the main purposes of any education system is to create individuals who are paying attention to their environment and are willing. It's really about being willing to give back, to contribute to the well-being of a community. And I can take a moment to stop if you want to ask me a question or if you want me to keep going, I will. Uh, you know, uh, I don't have a question, but you know, just sort of Ali just joined us. So I just like to you know, just welcome Mr. Sadaf. Mr. Sadaf, are you there? Yes. Hi, Jana Sahib. Assalamu alaikum. And hi, Jessica. Nice to hear you. So I just have a few minutes. Uh, as you know, I'm traveling. I'm right now in Karachi. Uh, so good luck. Uh, thank you, Jana Sahib, for coordinating uh, the session with Dr. Jessica Ash all the way from U.S., and I think our focus area, uh, we want her to be involved in especially online courses with the SDGs Academy of Pakistan, especially on uh, SDG 8, which is decent work and economic growth, and also SDG 5, which is gender equality. I think it's a great combination. And Jessica has been working with different countries on to empower the female entrepreneurs and also giving uh, them the lectures and uh, guide them how to grow their businesses. So uh, we will have a focus Zoom meeting separately on these two sustainable development goals. It's a good startup. And uh, Jessica is involved, I think, in other education institutions in Pakistan, which is highly, uh, I think, uh, commendable and her efforts to empower and help those people who don't have access. So both I once again thanks Mr. Jenna and Jessica to be part of our team and I'll be looking forward to work with you on the projects that I discussed. So good luck Jenna for the rest of the session. Thank you. Sarah, thank you, madam. Yes, yes. Over to you, Jessica. Okay, wonderful. Uh, and I'm happy to teach for um, in Pakistan and I'll tell you right now that I have join forces with Success World One, which is um, Queen Nadia Hariri, the Queen of Africa. She was crowned Queen of Africa by the Barule family in the Ivory Coast. Um, she is also the Queen of Hawaii. She is wife to King Kali'i Silva. Um, but this uh, Queen Nadia has founded Success World One to have online free classes around the world. So um, she has over 500 professors, doctors from universities in different countries who are teaching everything from Arabic, Urdu, French, um, free around the world. I start in a couple of weeks. I'll be teaching habits for success um, around the world. And then I'll also be doing some teacher training around the world with Success World One. And I am happy um, to also teach with you guys uh, with the SDG Academy in Pakistan. Uh, it's a very exciting opportunity. One of the 
main points that I want to get across uh, for people with no access to education is that this trait of creative problem solving really is a solution to community um, challenges. And whether, whether somebody, um, so many people have been kind of trained like to not engage with their own abilities. And that's sad. Uh, and I, I called my station mindset because the solution to the world's problems are often inside of us. They actually are in each one of us. And I'll give you an example of my friend in the DR Congo. His name is Jimmy Nangongo, and he works for Integrated Youth Empowerment Center, IYEC. It's a nonprofit. And I know that the context of the DR Congo is very different from Pakistan. So I'm not trying to make any kind of analogies there, but I am talking about mindset growth. When I first started working with Jimmy over a year ago, he would just say, give me money, give me money, give me money. And I was like, I don't have any money to give. I have education to give. And so he said, all right. And I started training him in um, personal leadership. How do you lead yourself? And I sent, I sent him all of my materials. Now he's the head of this nonprofit and he has a lot of volunteers. So, and he, but he was the only one with internet access. So I started sending him every PowerPoint I had, every document I had about leadership. And leadership begins with leadership of yourself. And over time, you know, he would ask me smart questions about these kinds of concepts. And for let me give you another really vital one. Um, and this is the idea that uh, as I'm, I'm going to give you a kind of a metaphor, a dog, if a dog sees a squirrel, he doesn't think he just instantly reacts and he chases it because it's an instinct. And so that's the idea of a reaction. It's just an instinct and it's kind of instantaneous. Humans, we have this magnificent brain and this ability for when there's a stimulus that enters our mind and our heart, we don't have to just react. We can let this stimulus kind of sit on our brain and in our heart and we can think, well, how can I respond to this such that I'm proud of myself? And that takes some training. This is one of many tools for peace, but it's also a tool for personal leadership because we've all reacted in ways that we're not necessarily proud of. But if we can reflect and still come up with a, a, a response to any stimulus that, that might have a really positive impact in the situation, then the whole world can be better. So that's the example of being reactionary or versus responsible. And that brings us to the word responsible. And it's really that kind of um, mind shift that develops people. And so I kept sending Jimmy all of my materials and we would have conversations about being responsible and everything else under the sun. And then he started sending me video of him training his volunteers. So he had, you know, he had the image of this sheep enclosure up there as an example of creative problem solving and helping people to realize that they do have the ability to solve some kind of problem 
where they live. And purposefully here, we did not discuss anything about any government. And I, I wanna be very specific that this has nothing to do with any type of government on earth. And so after he trained his volunteers uh, and all those videos are on Mindset News, he then connected me with a group of um, rape victims. And I, my degree is not in, it's not in economics and it's also not in psychotherapy um, or psychology. So I wasn't able to counsel the women necessarily in how to overcome that victimization, but I did become their mentor and I would send them optimistic messages saying, you can overcome this. One of the amazing things about people in developing nations is their amazing resilience. You guys have overcome so much. You're always overcoming something and you keep overcoming. And that resilience is key to the future. So I talked to these women about overcoming and kept training the volunteers. And about six months later, the, the last video in this series was these women who literally were victims, they became self-empowered. They started selling fruits and vegetables sustainably within their community. So they weren't charging exorbitant fees. The, the fees were ex, you know, sustainable in that community. And they were feeding their own families, which include the children of rape. And they were um, literally dancing in the street at the thought that they had something to contribute to make their community better. And when we talk about mind shift, this is a great example because in, in pr particular, the women who were victims, you get, if you are a victim of anything and really bad things happen to all of us, every single person has trauma to overcome. But if you move from a mental state of victimhood to one of self-empowerment and you focus on overcoming whatever challenge you've had, that's the key to life. It's the key to happiness. And it's, you know, it's the key to well-being. And so the idea of moving from a mental state of victimhood to one of um, community self-reliance, just look around and see what your community needs and do it. And um, I had one person once in Iraq at this point tell me uh, that trash was dirty. And I said, well, trash is dirty, uh, but it has to be picked up. And in the United States and in other Western nations, huge corporations make tons of money cleaning up. Waste management is a huge business. And the people who are garbage men are proud that they can provide for their families. They don't worry about the, any kind of stigma about picking up trash. They are solving a community problem. They're offering a vital community service and they're feeding their families. And there are businesses like that all over the world. Let's move on to plumbing, for example. Plumber, being a plumber in the United States is one of the richest professions. People don't talk about it a lot because it's not sexy, it's not fancy, it's not exciting. Um, but with a small amount of training, you can make $100,000 a year. Sure, no one wants to clean toilets. Nobody really wants to, but if you are a plumber who then employs people like so you develop a business then you're a leader you're a community leader you're providing employment you're also probably training younger people in this profession and you're providing for your family and so and some people are so stuck on the stigma of it i don't dislike my plumber 
my plumber is a wonderful human. I give him a Christmas present every year. Um, another example would be uh, an owner of low income housing real estate. The person who provides low income housing is providing an important community service. He's making a lot of money ethically. And the other part of that is that low income housing, often there's a lot of crime there. So that person is trying to manage and decrease crime in these low income facility, in low income housing areas. Um, again, it's not a beautiful job. It's not being a doctor. But these people, they make good money because they're, they don't care about any kind of stigma attached to, you know, to recycling or whatever it is. When I go walk my dog, uh, for example, uh, the teenagers have been walking, the children have been walking their dogs since COVID happened. I'm sure it's the way for the parents to get their kids out of the house and say, go walk the dog. But those kids often don't clean up their dog's mess. And I don't, I'm not mad at that. I clean up my community. And someone might say, oh, you're picking up dog mess. I don't care what it is. I am cleaning my community. And I, I, it, this is just a mindset. Um, I also think of the elderly. One of my neighbors is in his late 90s and he's not able to do almost anything. Oh, we have a hand raised. Go ahead. Uh, just so you know, I have two questions here, right? Okay. That, you know, that every one of us have some sort of, you know, the quality built in. So, but how to explore that? You know, how to... Like 20 people sitting, right? right. So one of them, you know, us have a different quality. So how we can explore that one, right? Second, you know, how we can get you know, people to work for community, not only for themselves, but you know, in, by and large, people don't work for even themselves, you know. But you know, but, uh, you know forget about the community. Yes, Jessica, your comment. Yeah, so to find these innate abilities, um, I highly recommend doing volunteer work anywhere. So you can, uh, in the, there are many options in different places, but you know, in the United States, you can put, you can put products on, the, on a shelf at a, pan, a food pantry that gives food away for free. When you start doing things, like as much as I'm an educator, and I want to think that we can educate people and they'll act right. It's not the truth. The truth is we learn from our mistakes and I'm going to get to a real answer to your question, but I wanna give you an example first of how we learn from our mistakes. And uh, my son, when he was one, he, I was cooking dinner and he was playing safely with his little toys next to me in the kitchen. And I said, don't touch, hot. And I was pointing to the stove and boy, was he curious. His eyes lit up and I thought, oh no, what have I done? And I kept saying, don't touch hot. And I was looking at him and preparing dinner and chopping things. And then, and then sure enough, for an instant, I turned around and looked in the fridge and he was paying really close attention because he was curious and he took his little finger and he touched that stove and he screamed and howled and he had a little blister on his finger and he never touched the stove again. And so as much as I want to think as an educator that people learn because we go blah, 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 learn, Humans learn through doing things and through making mistakes. And so I, and this is also a way, um, the other benefits of trying to do anything is that you build contacts, you build references, and you build skill sets. 
you can volunteer uh, to, if you want to think about becoming a waiter, you know, people may not love the profession of being a waiter, but it's a very respectable profession. And so you can volunteer to be a busboy in a restaurant. And you'll get a little change here and there because the waiters aren't going to let you completely work for free, but you gain vital skill sets. You're picking up cups, you're picking up uh, silverware, you're cleaning things and learning, paying attention to what it is like to be a waiter. Now, this can apply really anywhere. You can uh, volunteer at a hotel to be. Uh, to work with the resident cleaning staff and and look at the hotel, then you, you'll figure out and see a hotel from a whole new light about what needs to be done in this place and do it. And you're going to make mistakes. Uh, when I founded Mindset News, I was deadly afraid. And, my, and when I look back a year ago at my first interview, it was kind of uh, pathetic. Uh, I made a lot of mistakes and I've learned a lot. I keep trying, I keep doing it and I keep making mistakes and I'm okay with those mistakes. And so in order to find these skills within yourself, go do things. And even if you're only a volunteer, you're going to meet somebody who will give you a job if you learn the ropes of that profession. So does that answer your question a little bit? Yes, 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 sir. Now the second question, how can you motivate people to work for community as a whole? Because you know, we have this very, you know, we don't have this tendency people to work for community. Only maybe little people work. Yeah, many, many people say this to me, and uh, it's not a part of our culture. If I had a penny for every time someone said, oh, that's not a part of our culture, I would be rich. Uh, and so culture has the ability and naturally evolves. It has the ability to evolve and it does evolve. Every time a person who's alive in that culture takes an action, the culture is changing a little bit, maybe in small amounts. But whether if you if you if you do have a job and you work in an office, clean if you clean it, anything, if you pick up something, then someone's going to see that action and they're going to they're going to follow suit. They're going to say, "Oh, that's a really good idea." So we're we're back to talking about leadership here. If you want to see community volunteerism and community service, do it and watch how it grows around you. Last year I started a global movement for community service. I had people in 15 countries picking up trash. These are all countries where community service doesn't exist. And they, I, they sent me a video, a short 15 second video of them picking up trash in their community. And they were saying, I'm not thinking about COVID because I'm too busy making my community a better place. It's that simple. And then you all of a sudden you're a leader. And I'm going to get to these questions in one second, but I invite anybody who's listening to take a 15 second video of you cleaning up anything, doing any babysitting. You could teach for free if you're a teacher. Take a 15 second video saying, I'm not worried about COVID because I'm too busy helping my community become a better place and send it to us. Send it to Mindset News or send it to Mr. Ali Jana and let's create another movement. Uh, yes, we have two questions here. Go ahead, Zishan Jawed. Thank you, Kesi. Uh, I have listened to you. Uh, but he has uh, my throat is not well because of some, uh, but I feel that how do 
we can attract people for doing the volunteer jobs because there are the basic needs like logical needs and the self fulfillment needs so what is the key to attract people for the volunteer work thank you you kind of broke up i i can't yeah. hear the whole question can no, you type no. he was saying you know how you can attract people to do volunteer work right right um so if your community looks better and feels better then people feel better and so if you start doing it people naturally um gravitate towards it and it it is a natural ten- tendency if you see somebody doing something good you think wow that's a really good idea and it's not so difficult and and here's another thing you you can get any local businesses involved and how what that looks like is and I'll give you an example uh my son uh is now an eagle scout but as a process of becoming an eagle scout you have to find a problem in your community and you have to solve it and so when he was in high school he went to a local construction business and said if you bring your tools to this site and and monitor our using them drills hammers um then we will put a little plaque on the bottom of this thing that we're doing that says uh construction equipment donated by this business and they make an advertisement out of it uh such and such a construction company we are making our community better by helping these these uh projects and then we also had the local hardware store donated things like nails and we took pictures and they the community hardware store used those pictures as advertising and um then of course you have adults that are supervising the youth because you don't really want a 17-year-old with a drill in his hand unless he's supervised but it was the youth and so then my son got all of his friends involved he got local businesses involved and this was a 16-year-old and they fixed a local bridge uh it was a pedestrian or walking bridge and all of these businesses were interested because it's free advertising and boy do other people in the community now pay attention everybody who walks over that bridge thinks oh i'm going to use that construction company if i need anything built and they also think well i'm going to go to that hardware store the next time i need nails because they're focused on making our community better and to keep going for to answer zishan's question one other thing is in any moment of tragedy if there's an earthquake or a flood uh, our businesses give stuff away like when there was a um the tragedy in louisiana home depot around the country people were just walking out of the store with what they needed to repair their place for and nobody in america forgot that we all still shop at home depot and home depot gave away millions of dollars of product because the community needed it um so those are some of the ways that you can get other members of your community involved uh, uh we have sayed's question then we have a couple things written down yeah. yes a piece of your question please Sayed. It's Sayed. Yeah, Sayed Hafiz. Thank you very much. Uh, Jessica, I just uh, wanted to add uh, uh, your point of view, to, uh, whatever you are saying. Uh, uh, first of all, I, was, I, I want to say thanks to my faculty members. Uh, Ms. Poonam Riyaz, she is uh, a faculty member at Indus University. She has joined us and she is also expert in the, uh, uh, in the economic side. She, is, she has been teaching courses uh, in economic and business. uh i want to make sure this uh, i want to just clear this thing that uh, we at the, the industry university are focusing on developing character uh 
instead of just uh, giving them a, a regular type of lecturing, we are trying to build the character. Because that if, 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 the, if these students have a proper good character, they can contribute in the society. Uh, so we are we are focusing, we are emphasizing uh, on developing their character. Giving, we are trying to give, uh, we are uh, we are trying to give them a lesson that how to respect uh, their elders and how to say uh, honest. You should be honest to yourself and to the other people. And uh, I hope that this particular uh, action, uh, little action, uh, that the university should focus on developing uh, their, uh, their their the characters. They should also contribute to the to the uh, to the society, so that the uh, the uh, so that they can say that the development of the society can easily take place in this. Country. This is what I want to say, sir. Right. Okay, uh, Miss Jessica. Jessica is also uh, accepting this thing that we have to develop the character rather than we are just developing other things. Uh, we have to focus on this thing as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Hey, Jessica, over to you. Yeah, I heard him really well. So uh, I teach character. I have always taught character is um, vital to the future of humanity. And in different countries, sometimes parents say, oh, the school system is failing us. And then sometimes the schools say, oh, the parents are so horrible. I don't care whose job it is. Children need to learn how to live a values-based life, character. Now, we are talking about character here. We're talking about realizing that your community needs something. Also, one of the things that teenagers have a really hard time with is self-control. And so I have, uh, you know, because teenagers have all of these hormones and they don't know what to do with them. And Frankly, that's one of the reasons why we have so many sports in the United States. Uh, young children, youth participate in sports to get rid of their negative energy. It's a great place to get rid of all of that hormonal uh, angst inside of them. Uh, but one aspect I teach is when we talk about self-control, uh, I, I use an analogy of driving. It's a really big moment in a youth's life when he gets his driver's license or her driver's license. And it, it represents great freedom because they don't have to drive with their parent anymore. And these youth are trying to establish their own sense of self as different from their parents. And it's a very pivotal moment in life because how can somebody say, I'm different from my father and mother, but I still respect them. It's fairly common for teenagers to say, oh, mom, we don't do things like that anymore. So it is a natural process for a teenager to develop their independent sense of self. And how can they do that with respecting their elders. And so um, an example, going back to the example of driving, it's great when they get, and it's a great freedom to drive, but when they have that license, they're not allowed to drive on the wrong side of the road because that would kill people. So, or, you know, that's just an example. Or if you see a red light, if you have the freedom to drive, you have the responsibility to stop at a red light so you don't kill someone. These are very basic ideas, and that's why I use the image of getting a driver's license. But what I'm teaching through this analogy is there is no freedom without responsibility. And uh, if you have people that are just acting irresponsibly with their freedom, then eventually in the United States, you lose it. If you drink alcohol and then drive, you're going to lose your license forever. Eventually it's going to happen. So if you don't respect the inherent link between freedom and responsibility, then your freedoms go away. 
And so I teach that explicitly and there are many other areas of teaching there is no freedom without responsibility. By the way, that statement goes back to our founding fathers. Uh, they, one of our founding fathers was one of the first people to come up with that statement or maybe not the first person in history, but the first person to be famous for saying there is no freedom without responsibility. And another part of character is learning to, um, learning to resolve conflict and realizing that conflict is a necessary part of life. You're gonna disagree with people, period. But how can you disagree with people in a peaceful manner? So one of the things I teach at the university is debate. And that's why I was happy to mentor the student debate team at University of Management and Technology in Lahore because, uh, and I also work with using debate as a tool to build society because it is, debate is disagreeing in a civil manner using evidence. And it's so simple when you say it, to disagree in a civil manner using evidence. And it teaches people to disagree in that way. And you don't have to um, hit people in order to disagree. And I work with counselors in prisons and they say the one thing that those people never learned is how to disagree without shooting them. It's a very basic skill set that is fundamental for character building. Um, and there are a lot of traits like that. Uh, so Syed, and I guess I'm also speaking to Ms. Poonam Riaz, um, does that give you some answer to some of your question? Yeah, Ms. Poonam, would you like to add something? How are you all? Assalamu alaikum, all of you. Alaikum uh, salam. Yes, I'm hearing you, uh, ma'am. Uh, and the, the whole gist of uh, this topic is quite interesting. And definitely right now, the same we are suffering uh, as uh, Hafiz uh, Sahab said, ke, the students, normally they are not uh, good in behavior. So I just want to add some points, which I'm observing. Uh, as a teacher, as a faculty member, that the main uh, thing is, which I have noticed uh, in my students, that uh, basically, I'm listening. Basically, they are, yeah, basically they are not feeling that they are students. At the time of uh, conducting lectures, some of the students' behavior, I have noticed that they are pretending that we are, we are having knowledge more than you, and we don't, we don't want to listen to you. So. Uh, very good, very good. Yes, because uh, they are pretending that this is basically uh, just a just a piece of. I'm sorry, it's just because of my internet problem. I'm just a little bit in disconnection. Yes, so I was saying that uh, my students they are pretending in front of me, and I have noticed in my in in this university as well as, and I'm a faculty member as a visiting in Karachi University as well. So the main point I have noticed the students normally uh, at uh, the level of masters and uh, uh, MPhil level, the student, they are not uh, taking that much serious interest. They are normally pretending that we can get all type of knowledge and information from the internet and from the notes. We don't want to listen each and every point of our teacher. We can get all these information from internet and from the books. Basically what yeah. they are, Basically, uh, and if I'm going to talk about the bachelor students, so what they are folk, uh, telling me about their behavior from their behavior that, uh, ma'am, we just need uh, that type of materials uh, 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 which can give us that much uh, support to get clear these exams. 
they don't want to learn they are just uh, keeping in their mind that we have to clear the semester we need a good gp it's cgp and then we can easily get the job in uh, matlab after four years so normally what i've been yeah. telling to no, my no. students you are very rightly said you know but i i in my take a comment from jira sir jira sir if you jira sir if you if you allow me can i respond to her oh. question yes yeah, sure yes. okay fine when i'm let me tell you actually what's happening right now you are rightly said that a student does not have a confidence on the teachers now and uh, they expect uh, that they can't help us more so they just say teach us whatever is written in the hsc curriculum and we we need to qualify the exam and thus we will learn from the market so what's happening right now that what we need to teach the students in in uh, let's say colleges we are teaching them in a very you know this is a complete cycle we need to teach our students in schools what they need in colleges we need to teach our students in colleges what they need in universities we need to teach our students in universities what they need in their job markets so i think uh, must be 10 years before i started talking on the idea of university plus what was that it is still working but i am not more, much more successful than that because academia has not tried to understand what i am saying i think 10 years before we start say we started saying that uh, we are not teaching our students demand driven education that's why gradually their appetite for the knowledge will come down mm -hmm. and they will lose interest in their academics actually that's happening right now students go to university only to get, just to get their gp and their degrees that's it you know you must be well aware of the fact that the selection of fip I agree with you, Final sir. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a starting Actually, point. The starting point for the success of a student. Otherwise, now, mm. how does a student uh, pick up the FIP? Right now, I'm talking about right now. He or she talks with the colleagues, with the friends, with the teachers, and when somebody says, "Okay, okay, I'll help you. I'll do it. I've already done it. I'll help you." Then the project is started. Now he or she goes to the teacher, and teacher say, "Fine." Uh, you do it or you don't do it normally teachers tell them anything which they already know but they do not know and the student comes with innovative idea so there is a there there is a greater uh, need for delinking this process and linking the industry now teachers or teachers and universities should tell the students okay bring a project and do it and bring along industry personnel also. we are not responsible for that exactly Now, exactly Our what was going to happen the student will go to the industry ask their demands set a process and i think we should make it a mandatory for the us for the industry the chamber chamber especially to help the yes. students for it so this is the only uh, response i would like thank you fine uh, thank i you. i want yes. to add one more one more thing uh, i just want to share with you people maybe i'll get a good but uh, but uh, should i say the response from all of you but i have done i have a course of macro economics as uh, hafiz rahman sir said that i am a teacher of uh, economics so what i have done in my this semester uh, along with the lectures at uh, the explanation and all in that i have planned the activity that i'll make them understand that how to do a research i told them that this is a macro subject macro economics so let's in study individual uh, macro contents like inflation unemployment and etc and we'll see the impact on gdp of pakistan so that was a little bit short activity i have planned for my students literally in the beginning in the two uh, sessions i have received a very bad response from them ma'am it's too hectic what is the purpose of doing this it will going to help us or not in the in, in the future or not then i will make them understand in one of in in the whole session third session i have but have taken just for only for this thing kid okay, let me tell you about the advantages of this activity this is the thing they they, they just need bookish knowledge na they just want to listen then keep in in the mind and wind up your paper that's all the semester is ended they don't want to do some like this if i have planned i said that okay in your spare time you better sit in the library go through this uh, books like this so they said guys we can get the information from internet as well why should we sit in the library so <laughs> this is even library is also much yeah. mashallah in my university we have a digital library as well as everything matlab is available for them 
but seriously uh, i'm very surprised after noticing their behavior and their attitude jessica now jessica you you come in you know and also you know we have uh, 30 more minutes so i would like to wrap up for in 20 minutes then we have a question session yes jessica can we please hello sorry about that i'm back yes jessica okay one of the Im important aspects that we are talking about with youth um is student centered the student centered approach and so and we're also talking about emotional intelligence here and building emotional intelligence so one of the things is to respect the the biology of where a 19 year old is in their life that they are in fact developing their independent sense of self as separate from the adults who preceded them and really it is their world now it's it's more theirs than it is ours and naturally they're going to want to do things differently than us um but one one of the things i go around teaching around the world is student centered teaching and in all of the best schools and i am also talking about medical school there is no lecture the teacher does not sit at the front of the room and go ah, 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 because students don't listen we know this and so i talk about how even in medical school the students are engaged in a team and they're solving problems yes they read the content but then they come to class and they work with the content it's them doing the work the teacher doesn't need to do the work the students are the ones who naturally want to struggle with the information and everybody hates a lecture around the world there's not a country where students don't hate lecturing students just don't listen they need to do things and so i literally go from university to university to university talking about the student centered approach and the biggest barrier to that is not the shape of the classroom or uh or how we've always done things and and i hear that all the time with it's not way that we do things well i'm going to go back to the concept that culture can evolve culture can evolve and every single person who takes an action is being a leader and helping to evolve their culture but the biggest problem or challenge to getting to student centered teacher really has to do with teacher self identity if a teacher thinks that he needs to sit in the front of the classroom and go blah 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 then that's what he'll do it doesn't matter how much research you throw at them a teacher wants to stand in the front of the room and lecture and all it does is build resentment students hate being lectured and the student centered approach is a great solution for them to be actually telling you what they know after they've read the information that helps them to grow it sounds like maybe miss miss punam riaz wants to say something or no Uh, yes, ma'am. I got, I got your point. I got your point, and definitely we do need to work something different for the students so that we can easily control them. And definitely, the purpose of all uh, these steps is to just give them a proper, suitable guideline. Being a teacher, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, we do a lot of problems. Yeah, we did the maja pin. Yes, the maja. Uh, Jessica, uh, that is a wonderful word you have used. Student-centric uh, approach, and I think that is the only solution to the problem right now. And Jena Sahab, but I would like uh, kindly, if you can manage, we should have a, a webinar on University Plus, and Jessica may explain the uh, student-centric approach. And this is something very much needed in Pakistan, and uh, I think that. Uh, we should
should try to make a framework or a structure in which uh, we can discuss it under a very sharp focus, very sharp focus. Jessica, the world is very attractive, the student centric approach. But before that, uh, Punam, what I would like to ask from you, how can we change the mindset of PhD doctors? Let me repeat again, PhD doctors, who still think, still think that they have to lead this knowledge economy. Yes, going in parallel with the student under this student centric approach, under a, a problem solving approach, involving them in, in, uh, in engaging them. And uh, we will have to start from the schools. So what we expect from the student in universities, we need to teach them in schools and colleges. You know, in universities, we are teaching them what is the AI, what is IoT, what is Python, how to write uh, algorithms in a, on a GitHub. Uh, if you want to solve the problem, I'm sorry, the world, the world is changed now. Unless we do not align with the world right now, right now, when I'm saying, I think we are not time critical. So, Jinnah Sahib, I will request you to currently arrange a webinar on University Plus, engage Nilam with you, and she will invite some uh, panelists. And uh, Jessica may kindly give a full-fledged presentation on her concept of student-centric approach. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, sir. And we definitely invite Ms. Poonam Riaz also with Jessica. Yes, Jessica, please proceed. Okay. Um, I wanted to address the idea of, uh, well, there are two questions out there. The first, uh, we've had some great participation from Zishan. He's talking about um, emotional intelligence and also, and, and character is also emotional intelligence. And obviously, Amar Jaffrey can sense my emotion when I talk about the student-centered approach. Um, I, I'm very your, 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 your body language, your body language is very important. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you are saying, you are saying from the heart, not from the mind. Please go ahead. Please uh, yes, go ahead. yes, I am accused of reaching the heart, reaching the mind through the heart. Uh, it is kind of the way I go. Um, but I wanted to address uh, the idea uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and the uh, when we. It's one of the reasons why I talk about specifically, for example, picking up trash or recycling is there is this, the, the stigma like, oh, I don't touch dirty things. But I have videos of a leader of youth in Algeria and he convinced his entire classroom to go pick up recycling bottles and they turned those recycling bottles in and they got pennies back. And then, I mean, we're talking about youth and we're talking about training. So we're not talking about millions of dollars here, but we are talking about a youth picking up a recycled bottle and getting a penny for it. And then they can go do something with those little amounts of dollars. That's training and it, we, it requires leaders. And I laugh. I can't help but laugh when we talk about um, educational leaders. There's so many professors who said when COVID started, they said, I'm not required to teach online and I won't. And those are educational leaders. Like we need people to lead youth. And so, you know, the world needs people to, to lead youth and um, so when we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of need, the, uh, one of the things we're talking about is getting rid of stigma about whatever it is you can do to feed your family. And I, I work a lot in countries where the governments are bad, like in the DR Congo and in several African countries, the president, who's not really a president, makes $600,000 a year, a month. I'm sorry, $600,000 a month in the Congo. And they don't have clean water. And uh, so like Lake Erie caught on fire. It was so polluted in the 80s. And you can go look up Lake Erie catches on fire. That's how bad the pollution was. And our government was so embarrassed, they cleaned it up 
and they had to pay people to go clean it up. And so, but, but we can't really affect a government, but I gave specific examples of how in a community where there is no governance, individuals can make positive change for self-reliance with just a small amount of mindset shift. And uh, I use that example to talk about the mentality of victimhood and the mentality of victimhood keeps us down. Like, oh, I'm a victim, my government's terrible. Oh, I can't overcome this. Well, you can overcome it. And you can't change your government, but I guarantee you people who are don't have food can go out and pick up recycling and earn pennies for it in any country. And it's just one example. I'm not trying to minimize the problem of hunger. I'm really not. And, and it's horrible that there are people starving all over the world. Um, and so I want to acknowledge that up front and, and not minimize that problem. But the parents of those children, if they get out of their feelings of victimhood, can go find a way to make a positive impact on their future. They just don't think they can. Um, so that was in relation to uh, talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and mindset growth. Um, are there other questions? Uh, Jessica, you have uh, another 10 minutes to you know, finish your talk and, uh, and then we have a 10 minute question answer. Jessica, I want to add one more thing, which, uh, sorry, uh, my talk is not well today, that instead of teaching the students textbooks, we must teach them the case studies, because the case studies are live and practical, which gives them the motivation to learn, because the textbooks, they have done a long, long time back. However, the case studies mostly attract, and they give the lesson learns to the all. So please comment on this. Thank you. Yeah, case studies are uh, an important part of medical school now. And so what you're saying comes directly from the research, uh, Zishan. And so it's like having the perfect person in my audience uh, because yeah, students read in their textbooks at home and then they come to class with this new knowledge that's just kind of sitting there and they don't really know what to do with it. And then as a part of a team, they work through a case, uh, a real life problem. And one of the things that that teaches them is one of those soft skills called teamwork. Uh, we all have to learn how to work as a team member as, you know, when we grow up. And uh, this also gets on to, goes back to emotional intelligence. So Uval Harari, who's an amazing uh, professor in Israel, he wrote a book called The 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. It says almost the same thing that Jack Ma, who is the head of Alibaba in China, he says the same thing. And then some of this conversation is saying the same thing. And I'm going to tell you what it is in a minute. In the United States, we have an organization called uh, the National Association of Colleges and Employers. And the resounding conclusion, no matter what country you're in, is that students can get computer skills from any institution or engineering skills. But where are they getting the soft skills? Where are they learning how to properly speak to uh, their employer? Because if those students are disrespecting their teachers and then they go on and do that with their employer, then they're not going to have a job for very long. So it doesn't matter what country you're in. It's acknowledged that students need this emotional intelligence and the ability to communicate. You, you can't just be an adult and get mad and yell at somebody. 
you have to work through that conflict. And frankly, that's how some of the world's biggest problems get solved is through conflict. We should do it this way. No, we should do it this way. These are healthy forms of conflict that are required to get to a better place. And so I don't advocate for no conflict. I advocate for working through conflict based on evidence and mutual self-respect. And there's a, a, a paradigm here of both self-confidence and respect for the other person uh, that you have to kind of learn to grapple with in order to, to move on. Uh, is there another question real quick? I just, I just want to add one thing. You know, if we, if we have a goal number four in place, when your curriculum was last revised, it also said when your trainers got trained. You know, the problem which we are facing you know, in Pakistan, our textbooks are very, very old and people have access to internet. So, you know, you'll be surprised that uh, you know, in some places we still teach uh, the DOS or the Windows 3.1. They still face it. So, you know, there's a, there's a generation gap, I say, right? The people, you know what uh, Mr. Jaffe earlier said, how you can change the mindset of a PhDs. So just because, you know, there is a big, big gap here. And honestly speaking, I don't blame the students because, you know, they have access, they have knowledge. Exactly. Uh, that's the gap right. we need to fill. Yes, Jessica, so, over to you. So I, I confront this concept a lot. And textbooks are now irrelevant, especially if you're talking about computer science. Whatever you publish in a book, it's irrelevant by the time the book is published. Uh, but there are platforms at, where so much is free, like Khan Academy, K-H-A-N Academy. They have every school subject from age five to 17 videos written material, audio material, practical exercises for free. So any teacher, and the other thing is a teacher doesn't need to have all the answers all the time. That's part of the point of not being the sage on the stage, but being the guide on the side is that I don't know everything about everything and I don't need to. Um, so any teacher can go to Khan Academy or frankly, YouTube, just basically, even through, I'm doing my master's degree in business. And after my teacher speaks, I go to YouTube and I put in conjoint analysis, conjoint analysis or multiple regression. And I watch more YouTube videos about it. And I, you know, all of these business companies, they're put, putting out basic information as marketing tools um, because they know it's how people start to interact with this material and you don't need a textbook and, and, and it's just free go to Khan Academy or YouTube and a teacher can use that information and the teacher doesn't need to be an expert in order to help the students become an expert I think that's often an inhibitor for a, a teacher I would happily walk into any medical school tomorrow and help a teacher to move to being from the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. Um, so free materials is one of it. And then we go back to mindset or mind shift. People say to me, oh, I wanna learn English, but I don't have time. Well, if you don't have time, then just don't do it. Don't pretend that you're gonna do it. But the statement be careful of the statement, I don't have time. If you say I don't have time, what that really means is it's not important to you. And I catch myself saying it sometimes because I have so many obligations uh, that I'm, but when I say to myself, when I say out loud, I don't have time, I'm checking myself with that self-awareness that Zishan mentioned earlier, typed earlier, that I know it means it's not important to me right now. And I don't teach English 
uh, online for free because frankly, if you really want to learn English, there are so many free resources. It's not even funny. You can listen, you can watch, you can type, you can, you can, you can really learn English free if you want to, you know, and I'll say that about any other subject. You can learn the basics of finance or accounting if you want to for free. You just have to be aggressive about your own future. And I use the image of a bus. I am not driving Bilal's, Bilal's bus. Bilal Amjad drives his own success bus. And if he wants to make excuses, and I'm not saying he is, I'm just saying anybody can say, oh, I can't do that. Well, actually you can. If you're in charge of your future, and I teach my students to ask smart questions. Like sometimes people will, will find me on Facebook and they'll say, what do you do? And I'm like, I would like for you to look at my profile and then ask me a smart question about what I do. D don't just message me and say, what do you do? I mean, that's not emotional intelligence. <laughs> Jessica, Jessica, can you can you give me a, a minute? Yeah, go ahead, Amar. You know, you are doing something very wonderful. You rightly said, yeah, you rightly said that you uh, uh, yeah. you you start from your heart and you go to the minds of people. So, Jira Sahib, what I would like to webinar on uh, student centric education university plan. Uh, uh, in that webinar, Jessica will give the presentation on the approach of student centric uh, approach of uh, universities, and I, I'm I'm very sure that this will be an amazing uh, webinar, and uh, definitely we would like to also contribute, and we will discuss not the problem we will discuss the solutions. Well, I think right now problem is well identified, mm -hmm. but the issues that we are not talking about solutions. So Jessica, I would beg leave from here because I have to attend another meeting. And thank you very much for all your time. And I know that you are an amazing person and you are getting very popular in Pakistan these days now. So uh, Jenna, I'll beg leave from the webinar and looking forward to talk to you later on, okay? Thank you, yes. thank you. Thanks for joining Mr. Joffrey. It was wonderful to see you. Uh, we have uh, exactly six minutes to wrap up. So, uh, before I come to again, any, any, any question, like to add anything? So then, you know, just you do the final, final round. I, I do want to yeah. um, say that I want to talk about leadership versus management and leadership of youth. Um, as a parent, uh, when my kids were in high school, when they started high school, I remembered how horrible I felt going to high school. High school students have to get up at the crap before sunrise. It's an ungodly hour that high school students have to get up at a, a moment in their life where they have 700% of the amount of hormones that they had the previous year. They're completely confused and they have to get up at the crack of dawn and go to this place where some, a bunch of teachers are gonna go blah, blah, blah all day. I remember how I felt. So my approach was first I lit incense. And then after I lit the incense, I could hear my son go. <sighs> so I knew he was starting to wake up. And then I would get a warm washcloth, um, you know, wet, and I would put it over their eyes to help their eyes wake up. And I would sing to them in French. And then I would make a huge breakfast. And it took dedication on my part. I got up every morning at five o'clock to make eggs and pancakes and um, some kind of protein. And boy, when a young boy smells that protein cooking, uh, you know, whether it's turkey or whatever, they start to wake up. And so I would, you know, have all of these things. And then I would tell really, really silly jokes that make you groan. So like, for example, um, 
um, do you know knock knock jokes, Mr. Ali Jana? Okay, so say uh, knock knock. Who is it? Gorilla. Who? Gorilla cheese sandwich. I'll be right over. You know, it's a groaning, simple joke, but uh, a teenager, and you can look those up, they're free online too. Uh, a teenager trying to wake up is suddenly inundated with the smell of good food and his eyes have been woken up gently with love and they can't help but get out of bed. And it's more about inspiring them to get up and deal with their day than it is about, I did not do the managing, managing of the homework. I want to see your essay. Did you write it? I didn't have to do that because instead I inspired them. And if you have a child, it's not about them getting taller in your house. It's about that character building and inspiring them to want to become their best selves, inspiring them to love learning. They're naturally curious. And it, it's less about, did you write that essay? Well, you know, you missed your grammar here. It's more about, wow, you wrote about, there's no freedom without responsibility. That's great. So, you know, that took up three minutes, but it's the difference between leadership and management. And, and that's just me as a parent. And um, the idea that don't protect your child from everything, let them make small mistakes. I used to say, I want my son to fall down one step. And the parents thought, the other mothers thought I was crazy because they all said, I want my child to never get hurt. And I was like, well, that's ridiculous. That's not how the life is. Your child will get hurt. The question is, will they be prepared to overcome it? And so um, when my son fell down two steps, he cried and he looked at the staircase in a whole new way and he never fell down the stairs again, just like with the stove. He never touched the stove again because he got a little boo-boo. Um, so those are some things about being a parent of, of youth. Just again, you know, I, have to, I have to stop you here because we are about the time, right? It's uh, 9.30, but final remark to uh, definitely, you know, we're going to again in the coming days. So, your final word, and then we conclude. Yes, Jessica. Oh, my final word for the day. Word. Okay, uh, Mr. Ali Jana, it was really wonderful to be here with you live in Pakistan. It's so exciting. And um, I look forward to the development of your country through. Um, individuals who are empowered and use their curiosity to cr um, creatively solve problems. And if you want the answer to how they, um, the farmer made the new enclosures for the animals, just uh, ask me for it. Find a way. Okay. We will, you know, I'll, I'll put this question to everyone and then, you know, we'll come back to you. Jessica, you know, thank you very much. Uh, you know, we had a good time with you. And I know, you know, we, we did not cover all. And of course, we not meant to cover all in first only one session. Hopefully, we'll be, meet again. And also, you know, uh, you have one invitation from Indus University. So soon, you know, I will talk to them and we'll finalize, you know, how we can, you know, we can do and we can, uh, you know, uh, you know, participate with the Indus University. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you again. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.